So I'm delighted to have as my guest here, Cash and White from BOK Financial, who I've known for a number of years through a number of different challenging assignments. Cash and what are you up to currently at BOK Financial, if I may ask? Yeah, I've been at BOK Financial for about three years after they uh, acquired my uh, previous bank. I was at Cobiz Financial in 2018. And today they've, uh, they're calling me the, the Director of Growth and Innovation. Well, that's, uh, that's an awesome title. So we're going to try to get into that in a second here. So, so one of the things that impressed me when I first met you at Cobiz Financial was your efforts to drive change. And part of driving change was convincing a lot of uh, traditional commercial lenders, that there were some different approaches that they could take, including taking advantage of things like SBA programs. And I guess I'm curious, driving change and, and making it stick uh, was something that was a big part of your job back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always enjo enjoyed a good challenge and obviously getting institutions that are maybe 20, 50 or 100 years old to embrace something that that I consider obvious uh, and maybe the rest of the market does, but for whatever in reason, that institution hasn't quite uh, developed the thought leadership around uh, the program to, to help them lead uh, uh, the rhetoric and the thought process around how maybe it's SBA lending or small business lending, or mm -hmm. maybe just an, efficient, an efficiency program can layer into the DNA of that bank because mm -hmm. it's very particular to each uh, culture. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one thing I've learned in, in doing a lot of de novo uh, concepts at several banks now is, is you, you really need to have patience yeah. um, and you need to let the key stakeholders uh, come to their own conclusion that, that this is a good idea mm -hmm. versus, you know, pushing the, the agenda too far to where, they almost feel like everything they're doing is just fulfilling my wishes yeah. uh, and to fulfill my agenda. So you really got to come at it from a, a team approach mm -hmm. and it's, it's slow and contemplative, but it's kind of like Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point where you mm -hmm. just feel like you're not really getting there. And then all of a sudden, boom, mm -hmm. you, you've just, you've hit that point where the key executives are starting to drink the Kool-Aid and mm -hmm. that's, that's, being uh, pr uh, promulgated all the way down to the line. Mm -hmm. And then you're having the line push up the news, the good news back up through those water cooler conversations and those grassroots interactions where they're, they're giving positive feedback. And that takes a while. You know, I, I would say, for example, SBA, that was about 18 to 24 months. I've, I've done that three times now. Mm -hmm. uh, a small business initiative that was about 18 months to get it up and running. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, any sort of technology or efficiency program that's sort of perpetual mm -hmm. where you have little mini wins along the way. Mm -hmm. You have dark valleys of despair <laughs> as well. <laughs> so so you, you did share with me years ago a diagram, which I, I probably mm -hmm. should find and share with others. But it was so, yeah. it was sort of how things start off. And there's enthusiasm and, yes. and a lot of excitement. And then you get into the valley of despair yes. very quickly. And you have to get through that. You do. You do. And knowing that that, that it's coming kind of helps um, prepare you for when those dark days come and and maybe it's just not working the way you wanted to, or you get a large uh, voice of dissension from a key executive that if you know that that was coming and you can anticipate it, it doesn't bother you. And you know, yep, yeah, okay. I knew this person would, would try and uh, cut my program off at the head. And <laughs> I saw it coming a mile away and we're just gonna keep plowing ahead. Yeah, no, that's great <laughs> advice. So how did you, very succinctly here, if you can actually do it, how did you convince the rank and file that for example, SBA programs really did make sense, not just for small, small businesses, but for middle market companies that they were calling on. Yeah, I think when it comes to, to SBA, you have to own the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started was telling the story. And this, usually the story at banks that don't do SBA lending is that SBA is a headache. There's mm -hmm. too much paperwork. It's expensive. It's for high risk lending. Uh, the SBA is never going to honor their guarantee. Mm -hmm. And so I spend the first few months owning the rhetoric and I say, no, it's an offensive new client acquisition tool. Mm -hmm. It does not make a bad loan good. Mm -hmm. 
And quite honestly, I don't know how you can call yourself a relevant commercial bank today without having a strong SBA department. Mm -hmm. And SBA really allows you to lean into where the world is going. And more and more of our clients don't have traditional collateral. Mm -hmm. right. And that's where that SBA guarantee can help plug that, that hole in your, um, uh, your arrow and your quivers and your ability to do loans with, with a significant lack of collateral. Mm -hmm. And there's also a, a really um, big change in, in business transition. So you're having a lot of partners buy each other out or businesses mm -hmm. selling. And to miss out on what is a highly lucrative deal flow via business transition and getting a new client, winning all the deposits and treasury, just because you won't embrace SBA, that's a huge miss. Yeah. And, and so the current institution that I'm at now, uh, previously they weren't doing any SBA lending. And it, it floored me when I was speaking to the bankers of how many opportunities a month that they would just pass on. Yeah. And they kind of just were fine with it. They're like, oh, we don't do that. We don't do that. Giving them an ability to say, you know, all those four or five deals a month that you're, you're saying, no, we can't. Like, we're going to give you an opportunity to take a look at those. Yeah. And it got them I, really ex excited. Yeah. I, well, I agree with you. I think it is a, a piece in the uh, in the arsenal that people need to have. So let me let me go with your idea about owning the rhetoric and also telling the story. You also did a real good job of telling the story using various social media tools. I remember you were one of the first bankers that I saw who published a lot on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And part of it was you were trying to tell a story, maybe in your words, own the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about how that's evolved, because I've seen you've done some other interesting things. You're doing video blogs today. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how that fits in. Yeah, I think just like anything, if people see that you've got a lot of confidence about the subject matter that you're talking about and that you can take a very complicated subject like SBA lending and distill it down to its essence, mm -hmm. uh, buttress with success stories, what a great way to tell the story. So I might do a posting on five myths of SBA lending. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, you know, show how that's not really true. But this is, I mean, SBA lending prior to 2015, it was an absolute train wreck. Mm -hmm. I hated doing SBA loans. It took forever. <laughs> People need to know that it's really improved. But to be honest, a lot of the executives at banks remember doing loan, SBA right. loans in the 90s and early 2000s. So you got to show them that it's not, it's not what it used to be. Um, but then, you know, regarding having a presence on social media, I think that goes to authenticity. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I've always pushed institutions I've been at, I remember being at JP Morgan and this is LinkedIn was just created and I was posting and there was, that was before there was a social media policy. Mm -hmm. I remember we were charging borrowers for online banking. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're early stages of online banking, social mm -hmm. media, but I was like, man, what a great way to get my thoughts out and, mm -hmm. and show an authentic voice and, and prospect. And and then what happened is banks clamped down on social media because they were worried what people would say. But now it's opening back up and they're realizing how important it is to give their bankers an authentic voice. Yeah. So what I have appreciated is the ability to, to, to do things like this um, with really no filter. I didn't have to get with corporate marketing and get permission mm -hmm. and, and ask all mm -hmm. these questions and make sure you say this and not, not say that. Because the business community wants to speak to somebody um, who isn't speaking through a corporate filter and people can tell that really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so if you can distill something complicated and speak in layman's terms, just like, like you and I are discussing right now, that seems to resonate a little bit more versus uh, a highly crafted corporate statement. So I try and put out as much uh, authentic material as I possibly can. Um, and that helps with your brand. Mm -hmm. And I always tell bankers when I'm training them, I'm like, why does somebody need to know you at Ned? Mm -hmm. Why? There's yeah. 500, 600 bankers in Metro Denver, why do they need to know you? Mm -hmm. What makes you relevant to the business community? And sometimes you need to be able to point to some sort of social media presence to, to show your authenticity and your thought leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's where having a niche can help. So mm -hmm. I've been able to find a niche in small business banking, SBA lending, and I'll speak to that. And luckily, you know, the markets I cover are a very vibrant SBA lending and they're, they're desperate for information because it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. But if you're a contract lender, I mean, the ability to go online and, and put out thought leadership around, you know, a highly nuanced uh, segment of commercial banking like contract lending, uh, I don't think people understand how valuable that is for authenticity and your personal brand. Yeah, I, I think there, there are two issues that I talk to bankers about. One is sort of your corporate brand 
which is important. You know, there's there's no question about the fact that there's there's value in being hitched to a good corporate brand, but there's your personal brand. And this gets to the, your issues. How do you begin to differentiate yourself in the marketplace? And I encourage people, as you do, to think about how they not only tell their own stories, and you can do it in a lot of different ways. I am curious about how you're finding video, because I think that's a piece in the puzzle today. But not only are they telling their own stories, they're, they're putting themselves in a position where they can be seen as a go-to person. And you know, it's not, um, it's not arrogant if you have developed an expertise in an area to be able to promote it to people. It's one of the ways you stand out. So how does video fit in? You're doing more of that these days. Yeah, video's new, obviously, something we had to pivot to um, with the pandemic, but uh, it's a great way. I mean, we're, we're our commercial bank for BOK Financials is in six states, and we're trying to get unique, authentic stories from our customers mm -hmm. to, to share with how they pivoted or survived mm -hmm. the pandemic, uh, lessons learned, <clears throat> and obviously, you know, using all this new technology, WebEx and Zoom is a great way. Uh, you know, and, and we seem to have a higher interaction rate with mm -hmm. video yeah. uh, than we do with, with reading. <laughs> like reading I, 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 I'm with you, Cash, and I think people have stopped reading what I wrote yeah. uh, years ago. I do think, again, customer stories that you can capture. I've, I've looked at some of the ones that Cash has, uh, has hosted, and they're great. If you think about testimonials, which is, again, a piece in the puzzle, it's much better if a customer says that you've helped them in some right. discreet way, then you talking about yourself. Yes. And the video is very powerful is in, in capturing that. Yeah, it is. And <clears throat> everyone has a different story. Um, but what I've always appreciated about these entrepreneurs is, um, you know, we talked earlier about the abyss of despair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that might be something that they go through on an annual basis because yeah. it's there's always something being thrown at you. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> hearing how all of their years of preparation prepared them for the pandemic and they didn't know it. Mm -hmm. All of the relationships they built over the years, mm -hmm. building a fortress balance sheet as much as a small business can, having those relationships with your banker. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of business owners realize how important that is. Yeah. As fintechs keep trying to dehumanize banking and make it all just algorithm, this reminded people how important it is to have a commercial banker that understands your business, that can help you defer your loan payments, quickly process your triple P loan, quickly get it forgiven mm -hmm. and not throw you into the special assets group and say, good luck, yeah. you know, and, and because there's that human interaction <clears throat> and that could have been with their CPA. It could have been with their, um, suppliers, their vendors, everybody, mm -hmm. all those years of building those relationships, they were able to finally uh, leverage them to survive what was a, you know, a tough few months there for a lot of people. And I love hearing those stories. Well, I, I think you're doing a good job of, of uh, getting them on video. And I would encourage people to take a look at them because it's a great way to tell a story. Let me let me get you to think a little bit about the future because you've lived through, uh, you know, the last uh 16 months when we're taping this very traumatic period for banks, which, and for their customers. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you think about, you know, one of the big challenges for a lot of financial institutions is how to grow and how to think about growth. Commercial and business banking is still a high priority area for a lot of financial institutions. You're thinking about growth at BOK Financial. What are some of the things that, as you look into the crystal ball, you're considering at this point? Yeah, you know, there's a big focus, obviously, with BOK Financial Purchasing Cobiz. That was their signal to the market that they're taking commercial banking seriously. And we're, we're defining that as banking businesses that do less than 50 million in revenue, which is 95% of the businesses in our footprint. <clears throat> and, you know, in order to do that, you need to be you need to be nimble. You need to have a really wide breadth of products um, because it it's not cookie cutter. Every client has a different uh, nuance or different need where I think uh, commercial banks like ourselves can find a way to, to get back to growth because, you know, nationally, this, this segment is down largely due to the fact that people are flush with triple P stimulus funds and uh, paying mm -hmm. down debt is paramount right now. But when we get back to growth, which we're estimating will happen near the end of this year, um, this is where SBA plays a big role. Mm -hmm. 
um, because you're going to be lending off of maybe some shaky 2020 and 2021 financials and that SBA, you know, guarantee can help mitigate some of that and let you lean into a situation you might Mm -hmm. necessarily not do um, in in normal times. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, continuing to leverage um, what may be considered more untraditional lending types. So ABL, Mm -hmm. I think is going to be important. I think there's also some um, nascent areas that we can take a look at, for example, SaaS lending, software mm-hmm. as a service. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you talk to Silicon Valley and they have a quote there that says software is going to eat the world. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of companies yeah. come to us with very untraditional collateral. Yeah. Why can't commercial banks learn how to take intellectual property as mm-hmm. collateral and take warrants? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some banks have figured it out. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, being able to, to handle situations that maybe five years ago we wouldn't see you know, maybe weird inventory. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got Intuit and Amazon, uh, Square, uh, mm-hmm. being able to have line to sight on a customer's inventory and, and able to to offer loans in real time, sometimes with no personal guarantee, just because they understand the ebbs and the flows and they have the data, yeah. you know, that, that lets them do untraditional underwriting. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, if banks were better at mining the data that we have, Mm-hmm. We have better data than Facebook and Google have. We've got Absolutely. everything. Yeah. And if we were able to better understand that data, Wall Street would start looking at us like they should, which are mm-hmm. technology companies, mm-hmm. you know, and our, our, our value could go way up. But we need to do a lot better job of being able to understand what's happening in a client's operating account and what role we can play uh, and what clues we can see there. So I, I think you're going to see a combination of embracing new lending protocols mixed with enhanced data mining Mm -hmm. will allow banks to simultaneously grow their existing book, deepen their relationships, and uh, better prospect with the next generation of entrepreneurs who don't really look like our current book today. Yeah. 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 I I think that's a great overview. I I had a conversation recently with a consultant who uh, does a lot of work with both banks and fintechs. And he said, you know, the banks are always admiring how agile and how quickly the fintechs can uh, position themselves. On the other hand, the fintechs are just are are so in awe of the data that Mm -hmm. financial institutions have, to your point. And again, if we can figure out as an industry, uh, how to mine that, how to how to figure out ways to do some of the things you're talking about. I think the growth trajectory uh, can be a whole lot more exciting than some people think. But uh, this has been fun, Cash, and I, uh, I appreciate uh, your participating in a NED Talks here. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, our paths cross again in the not too distant future because you're doing some really great things. So thanks for thanks for being a guest here this morning. Yeah, thanks, Ned. Good to see you. <laughs>